It's a tale as old as time, as long as time started on the 23rd of June in 1996, when Super Mario 64 released. Mario and Sonic were two of the biggest corporate rivals in the entertainment sector at the time, with Nintendo and Sega outdoing each other on every front they could, while also dealing with corporate sabotage on both ends, Nintendo making a second opponent shortly before that day, and with Sega of America dooming the company's success every step of the way. Once the dust settled, it became common knowledge that Nintendo had won the war, and Sonic was doomed to a lifetime of floundering. A lot of people say that it wasn't until Sonic Adventure 2 when the blue blur had found its footing. Some argued it wouldn't be until Heroes in 2004. Many argue that it wasn't until Sonic Colors in 2009. And even more still, argue that the resurgence in quality never happened. The character's last good adventure was Sonic 3 and Knuckles. Adventure was a buggy, bland looking mess that couldn't keep up with Super Mario 64's vibrance and fun. But that's an oral history corrupted throughout time. It's revisionist, and if you ever actually got to play the Dreamcast original, you would know many of the comments about the game's graphics and bugs are grossly overstated. All we need to do is buy a copy for the Dreamcast and, you know, play it. Luckily I own a Dreamcast, but I don't own a copy of Sonic Adventure. Let's just go over to yonder eBay and, uh, mm-hmm, no. 60 to 80 bucks. Ugh. Oh, wow. Okay, luckily, it's not the end of the world. The PC release has a mod literally called Better SADX, or the Dreamcast Conversion Mod. Either of these will turn this slick, greasy abomination into a pristine Dreamcast Wonderscape. And it's in 16x9. So now let's talk about how Sonic Adventure throws this game into 3D, what new it brings to the table, what makes this the next generational leap from 64, and then finally just get angry at the fact that Sega ruined it! So the best place to start is, obviously, Sonic. He's fast. But just being fast isn't enough for Genesis Sonic. If you want to go fast, you have to be skilled at the platforming. The better you do, the higher up on the screen you end up, and the more breakneck pace and treacherous platforming you need to do. If you can keep up with the platforming, you get more momentum. It's about momentum with classic Sonic, not speed. And I would argue Adventure keeps almost all of this intact. If you can spin dash up to a higher area in a map like Ice Cap, you can skip over a pretty big chunk of the stage. You don't have to do all these tedious platforming segments. You can find all sorts of shortcuts everywhere in this game. They're not as well highlighted as they would be in the Genesis games, but that gives Adventure's action stages this very mild sense of exploration and a ton of replayability. This is Sonic gameplay as told by Three of Knuckles, pure and simple, and it is completely uncompromising in its execution. Let's take a quick detour to talk Mario 64. They originally wanted individual levels with flagpoles at the end, just like the NES and SNES games. But that was an obvious strain on dev time and cartridge space, so the game instead became 15 open worlds with 7 objectives in each. There are short bonus levels, but they are the minority of the stars you will collect in that game. Likewise, just run and jump is too basic of a moveset, so Mario obtained kicks, punches, and all sorts of parkour. I am not dissing Mario 64. I love this game. But this is nothing like the Mario games that came before it. This is a reimagining of Mario's mechanics and ideas, whereas Sonic Adventure is kind of this raw, distilled blast processing, but bumped out to 3D. Sonic does have new moves. You can skim a trail of rings in an instant. There's jump pads to take you all around the level. You can charge up a spin dash to eliminate enemies, and you can stall in the air if need be. Hell, the homing attack was created to make combat in a Sonic 3D game more bearable and more precise. But these augment the classic style gameplay in a truly superb manner by again letting you get more explorative with the sprawling labyrinths in Sonic Adventure and find new and exciting ways to bust them in half. And once you've played these levels as Sonic with the classic gameplay style, the game changes things on you more and more. Tails plays the same levels, but this time racing against an NPC, putting the shortcuts you learn to Sonic to good use paired with Tails' flying ability letting you traverse a significant amount of the map if played right. Knuckles' stages are treasure hunts which give you the opportunity to explore every nook and cranny with his gliding and climbing. Amy's levels are part stealth, part chase sequence as you avoid zero. You still get speed, but you have to maintain that speed by jumping because Amy's gait is just slower than Sonic's but air velocity is about the same. E-101 turns these levels into arcadey time attack gauntlets full of destructibles and big just fishes. 
I mean, you explore the maps more because you clearly don't run around, you just collect fish. Each of these take the same environments in the same levels and flip them on their heads to make you think differently about the scant 11 zones. But there's not 11 levels. Each zone is broken up into acts. If the music changes and there's a scene between one section to another, congratulations, you're in a new act. When playing through Sonic or any of the other individual character storylines, the game seems pretty fragmented and jumbled. But that's just because you have a sixth of the story when you begin. Every character's personal narrative connects to each other in really interesting ways, and their outlook on the world affects how they see certain character motivations. It's a complete plot, but it's not a complicated one. Each character has stake in their emerald, and in playing their radically different takes on the various levels, you get to learn about their individual motivations and how their actions fit into the main story. And again, I need to stress, each character sees the events of this story a little differently. Robotnik is kind of a bumbling fool in Sonic's story, but is absolutely cruel and menacing in Tails's, even though it's the same events. That's attention to detail, fellas. And all of this is framed with some truly gorgeous graphics for the time. The Dreamcast was next-gen hardware when it launched, even if it was just a couple years after the likes of the N64 and PS1. This might have been caused by Sega Saturn's chances at American success being destroyed by one Tom Kilinski, who had announced the Saturn's launch at E3 that day instead of three months after, leaving a console that was hard to find poorly stocked and had no games. I mean, Bernie Stoller did step in to help kill the Saturn. He picked and chose exactly what software made it onto the Saturn, leaving just first-party titles and sports games. The entirety of the Saturn's US failure is amazing. I recommend diving into it. It's gross. But the Dreamcast was kind of Sega's swan song, pushing for next-gen hardware this soon, which would definitely blow away its competition. And in their defense, it does. Sonic Adventure 1 looks gorgeous. All of its lighting effects are just emissive textures, transparency, a global light, and specular maps. From the greenish tint to the lake and mystic ruins to gloomy nights and oppressive structures in Final Egg, Sonic Adventure looks insane for 1998. But we can agree this isn't what the game looks like now, right? Sonic Adventure isn't this stylish, this silky smooth anymore. It's not just getting older. Sonic Adventure DX is gimped. Lighting in particular has taken a hit dramatically. In the Dreamcast game, the Lantern Lighting Engine applies one of four diffuse palettes to a model to multiply its color data, and then attaches a specular palette to that model, and these palettes are different for each map. And individual models can pick what palette type they want to use, which lets the devs get really creative with how they light the game's environments. Sonic Adventure DX uses a simpler system that just lets them create as many as four lights, affect how they light up models, change the color of the highlights, create an ambient color, and then direct where that light goes. The debug menu for Sonic Adventure DX confirms they had planned to use the original palette files from the Dreamcast game, but for one reason or another the system was scrapped for this simpler lighting system. And that simpler lighting doesn't even work on the PC release, which is what the HD release is based after. Lighting is entirely blown out in the HD release, making nighttime look radioactive in a keenly disturbing way. All that's left is two basic color gradients, which rarely ever deviate from black to white gradients, making the level lighting feel really samey even in radically different environments. Ambient and specular are the only light types in the PC release, paired with an additional specular light that's so over the top it looks like some madman buttered up every model in this game. The HD version adds a shader over top of this to try to dial back the lighting, making the game look a little bit more like the GameCube release, but that's just kind of a cluttered mess at that point. It's a fix on top of a fix on top of a fix on top of a problem they didn't even really want to solve, so they just didn't. Honestly, at this point, there's nothing really stopping them from making the Lantern lighting engine work in the HD release. Textures are a mess, with the GameCube and PC releases being saved on what looks like JPEG. And rather than letting the CPU perform texture mirroring, mirrored textures are stored in that texture slot meaning the texture is now either half or a quarter of their original resolution. Character models are incomplete despite being higher poly count, with many effects like the glow around Sonic when he's charged or his shoes stretching as he runs, rendering incorrectly. One of the most egregious downgrades is the lack of transparency. 
The Dreamcast was the first home console to support order-independent transparency. It didn't matter how transparent objects were overlaid on opaque objects or even more transparent objects on the screen. The Dreamcast's GPU would sort it all out in a consistent manner with every draw call. They didn't have to build this buffered list of, we render all the opaques first and then all the transparents after and we render them in this order. It didn't matter. They could just say, render these polygons, and it would. And it wouldn't flicker or get weird doing that. The Dreamcast is still the only console to offer order-independent transparency built in on the hardware level. Nowadays, a third-party GPU would handle that sort of heavy lifting. That can't be ported, obviously. So Sega built a draw queue system, effectively sorting out exactly what order to render objects in on a given frame. However, that queue system wasn't debugged properly, or wasn't written properly. Either way, a number of transparency issues arise. Some of them are resolved by grabbing the alpha channel of a texture and only using values above a certain number in ditching others. That creates jagged edges on some surfaces and pretty much all particles, and as a result it just doesn't look good. It looks bad. It looks bad. The easiest way to sum up how Sega treats Adventure DX is to look at the intro FMV. The GameCube one is a compressed version of the Dreamcast one, but the difference is minor. The PC port is even more compressed, and the blocky artifacts of MPEG compression are so much more prevalent. The HD release is a further compressed version of the PC release, and the Steam release is that same HD version, but now desaturated a little in order to hide even more compression. If you don't see what I'm talking about, watch this on a bigger screen, or just look at the link in the description. It's kind of gross. Sonic Adventure DX is treated very poorly by Sega, and a lot of people chalk up its jank to the game just being old. But the Dreamcast release didn't look like that at all. It's only after they started messing with the game to try to make it stand alongside the likes of Sonic Adventure 2 and Heroes that cracks started to form in the facade. The GameCube gave Sega a great chance to clean up the Dreamcast games for a new audience, and Sonic Adventure 2 sold like hotcakes on the thing. They wanted the first game on the console to go alongside Sonic Adventure 2, but they didn't want the game to look outdated, and clearly had issues working with non-Dreamcast hardware. And the end result is a game that looks like this. What I don't get is why these changes just kept getting exacerbated on every new platform. With the PS3 and 360 ports, certainly emulating the Dreamcast game's look wouldn't be an impossibility. Transparent objects are much easier to render in 2010 than they were in 2004, or even the Dreamcast circa 98. And the better SADX mod proves that modern hardware can recreate the look of the original game. So why doesn't Sega put in the effort? In a lot of ways, it's because Sonic Adventure is old, and it's not what Sega wants for Sonic. The last game to include action stages and adventure fields was the 2006 Sonic... Do I need to say anything else, actually? I think 2006 is enough when talking Sonic. <laughs> um, oh. And now Sonic is either all about boosting or pandering to dear sweet mother nostalgia. Those games are in the past. Please, buy Sonic Mania. Look, we added the drop dash to Sonic 1 in the Aegis port. Buy Sonic. New. Sonic, please. The old games can be new when we want them to be new. Sonic Adventure is better than people give it credit for, and that's by and large Sonic's most ambitious title. Six unique playstyles, a non-linear plot that focuses on developing classic characters, the only new major characters being Big the Cat, the antagonist, and one of Robotnik's machines. There's a soundtrack performed by a real rock band, it's all CD, Red Book Audio, with fun level design that perfectly captures what made Sonic's 2 and 3 successful. This game should have absolutely crushed Mario 64 when it came out. This was the next generation for Sonic, and in a way it was the next generation for gaming as a whole. This was a look at the 6th generation so soon after the 5th began. And it was panned. I mean, it did pretty dang well, scoring an average rating of about 85%. But its major drawbacks were its ambition. Lip syncing and fully voiced dialogue was criticized. The different gameplay styles were panned, and fishing and raising pets isn't usually what you want to do in a Sonic game. Honestly, having played Sonic Adventure 1 in a pure form, as least as pure of a form as we can get it, I think I like it more than Sonic Adventure 2. The Chow Garden in Sonic Adventure 2 is way better, and the gameplay roulette's been ironed out to three pretty similar playstyles, which I like, but the first game's plot is much more airtight and wouldn't need a thousand extra side games to round out the story behind Gun, 
The levels in 2 are much more linear and lock a lot of the panache that made Genesis Sonic so replayable and explorable. There aren't those alternate paths, you really can't use spin dashes to clip up the side of a wall or reach a new path. It all kind of is just one big path. Sonic Adventure 2 isn't bad, just Sonic Adventure 1 is way more ambitious and way more endearing as a result. This is not a dismissal of Mario 64 or Sonic Adventure 2. I love both those games to death, but the love for Sonic Adventure these days is misguided or ironic. Stuffed to the gills with these disclaimers about how we're supposed to acknowledge how bad the game is when it never was bad in the first place. I cannot forgive Sega's treatment of the director's cut, but I can say that better SADX or the Dreamcast conversion mod do help significantly in restoring this classic. And a special thank you to PKR, Sonico, Speeps Highway, and Spookme Man from Dreamcastify for compiling all the various technical mishaps in the director's cut. If you've dismissed the original for its presentation or bugs, I highly recommend checking out the restoration mod. The game's 8 bucks on Steam, and if you can run Sonic Mania, you can run Sonic Adventure. And I don't need to tell you twice that you almost certainly can run Sonic Mania. All I can hope is that one day, projects like these will make Sega realize that people love adventure but dislike the director's cut for special editioning all over the game in the worst way. Maybe that'll lead to a push to get a proper remaster. Maybe that'll just lead to a push to get Sonic Adventure, the Dreamcast Sonic Adventure, on digital marketplaces. The last thing anyone in the Sonic fandom wants is a remake that uses this as a basis. I mean, what the hell is this supposed to be? Tell me, Sega, what is that? It was lights. It was light coming from a grate up top. But what is it now? Why haven't you fixed this? You added this to like three more ports. You can fix it. <laughs> if you like this video and you'd like to see more, I'd recommend subscribing. Patreon and social media links are in the description.